So in section 2.2, we're gonna continue working with data and trying to summarize our data. In section 2.1, we came up with a frequency distribution. So that frequency distribution for our uh, old faithful data looked like this. We had a lot of eruptions that lasted between 200 and 224, or 225 and 249 uh, seconds. So that's where most of our data lied, but then we had some other ones as well. But as a species, we're more visually oriented. We like to see things visually. And even though we have the relative frequencies here, it's much more impactful if we can graph this. So we're gonna do that by copying this data from here and pasting it into StatDisk over here. So this is the online version of StatDisk. You can easily create an account and sign in for free. So I've pasted this here, but now I wanna see things visually. So to do that, let's go over to uh, data, click the data tab. And do you see anything underneath here that looks promising? Yeah, I'm so thinking, histogram. So this histogram, so wow. You guys have no clue just how lucky you guys are. You don't have to do any of this stuff by hand. When I first started teaching this course in 19 Mumble Mumble, a lot more of this stuff was done by hand. Now it says select columns. Well, there's really only one choice because we only have one column of data. And if you want, you can give it a title, something relevant like old faithful. Um, duration. And let's actually do something down here. Instead of clicking an auto fit, let's click a user to find. Now our class width for the previous example in section 2.1 was 25. That's how wide our classes were. And they started at 100. So let's click both of those and then take a look at a graph of our frequencies. And what's gonna happen is that we're gonna see bars that are drawn proportionate uh, in height to these frequencies. So, okay, let's take a look at that. When you're ready, press plot, and you should see something like this. Yay. So there's our frequency histogram, and it's showing us visually what we saw anyways. Now the nice thing is that if you bring your cursor over it, it'll tell you the exact frequency. We can kind of make a guess by looking at the height here, but it's nice that you can actually get the exact values as well. Well, let's talk about the shapes of our data, because that's what really what we're looking at is the shape of our data. And there's a lot of different possibilities, some of which have some names that I'd like you to be familiar with. So let's look at those, those are on page 52. The classic one that we like to see and that uh, a lot of our work's gonna be based off is a normal distribution or a bell-shaped distribution. The name I'm hoping is self-evident. The profile of this data looks kind of like a bell. Uh, it's also called a Gaussian if you wanna be a show-off, but a normal distribution is typically what we refer to it as. Um, height is typically distributed uh, normally. IQ is supposed to have a normal distribution. There's a lot of phenomenon that are modeled very well with a normal distribution. But there's other distributions as well. You can have a uniform distribution in which things are pretty much the same, you know, regardless. You might think that um, the leading digit of you know data in, in a lot of situations has an equal chance of being a one, a two, a three, a four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, but you'd be wrong. Uh, a uniform distribution would be that, that you know the probability that a leading digit is, is a, any of those numbers is the same. This would be a uniform distribution, but there's actually a different shape to that data. And we'll look at that later in this course. Now, speaking of different shapes, there's a couple other ones. This kind of looks like a, a normal distribution, except one thing. 
Can anyone tell me the difference, the, the subtle difference between graph A and graph B? The increases to the right? Yeah. So you've got this tail to the right. And where the tail is, is called the skewness. So this is skewed to the right because that's where the tail is. So that would, that would increase the mean. The mean up here would typically be around the center of your data. But here, the mean is going to get dragged to the right. And by mean, I mean average. The average is going to get dragged to the right because you get this tail that goes a little farther out to the right than it does off to the left. The reverse is true over here. This one is skewed to the left. So you've got more observations in the left tail than you do the right tail. So that's where the skewness is. Let's look back at our data here in uh, StatDisk. Now I mentioned earlier that there's three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. That's because you can manipulate things in a lot of ways to give a different appearance to something. So <clears throat> uh, let's take a look at this and play with it in different ways. So what if we changed our class width from 25 down to maybe 15 and then look at it? Hmm, that looks pretty different than what we just had, right? And part of the problem with what we just had is you got this one little number here, way down here. Um, this, it almost feels like a typo, all right? But what if we started our class instead of up here at, or all the way down here at 100, what if we started at maybe 180 and then take a look at it? Wow, oh, that gives more room for our data to spread out. And now it looks a little bit different. Let's lower our class width even further, down to 10. Now, except for this couple outliers here, what's the rest of this data look like? What shape does that seem to have? Ignoring this one here. A bell? Yeah, it kind of looks like a bell-shaped distribution, right? And I'm glad no one answered that uh, was somebody flipping us off, because it almost looks like that as well. But it's a bell-shaped distribution, more or less. Maybe it's a bell-shaped distribution with a skew to the left. So you've got to be careful with how you define your class widths. Now, some people can actually cheat when they present their data. Because what they'll do is they'll have unequal size class classes. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And that's really not very fair to the reader of your histogram. I don't think there's much justification for having unequal sizes, except maybe at the end, kind of the catch-all. Everything lower than this and everything greater than this. <clears throat> um, <laughs> now, uh, uh, let's see, problem number 18. Now, <clears throat> one of the big things that we're going to have to do in this course is try and determine when something has a normal distribution. And for that, we're going to take a look at what's called uh, a normal quantile plot. And we can start looking at that at page 30, uh, 54. So let me flip over to page 54 here. We'll jump up a little bit. And a normal quantile plot gives you a way to look at data and determine if it's a normal distribution. Now, I'm not going to explain the particulars about your data. Um, but if it's, a, if it's a normal distribution, when you do these normal quantile plots, you should get data that's distributed kind of around the line. There shouldn't be necessarily any pattern to this. It should just be randomly distributed around a line. Now, I, I wouldn't be really happy about this one down here. This one up here is not too bad, but overall, these seem like they're randomly distributed around a line. 
and that's reasonably close to a normal distribution. Uh, something like this, yeah, that one, that one's an epic fail. And uh, the terms of my son call that an epic fail. This one is very far from a normal distribution because you got this huge congregation of dots right here at one end of the line. So that one fails. You also got this extreme outlier over here. This one looks pretty good, except for one thing. There's a systematic uh, weaving above and below of these points around the line. And because of that pattern, it's not a random pattern, um, then this is, not a, uh, this is not reflective of a normal distribution. Now, some of these things might seem kind of tricky. It's like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> how am I gonna expect to know you know, in this case, that this is a normal distribution or not. The short answer is, I'm not gonna give you something that's difficult. I'm gonna give you something that's pretty obvious, either something that's nice and close or something that's far away, but I'm not gonna give you something in between. That said, let's take a look at a couple examples. And for that, I'm gonna flip over to problem number 50 or page 57. and look at problem number 18. And let me ask you, um, which one of these look like they're normal? Let's start with A. Would you guess this comes from a normal distribution or not? No. No. Because no. it's got that systematic pattern that we're not really looking to see in our quantile plots. How about B? No. No. Nope. C? Yes. yes. All right, good. Yeah, I'd agree with you on C uh, as well. Yeah, this one looks pretty reasonable. This is the kind of, you know, loose scattering around a line that I would expect to see from our normal quantile plots. That reflects a bell-shaped distribution. How about D? No. No. Yeah, you know, again, there might be a little bit of a pattern that snakes its way through here. It's not looking good. So of these four, only one of them actually reflects uh, a regular uh, bell-shaped distribution. <clears throat> okay, cool. Anything else? Um, are we good with what we covered here in this section? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Let me uh, check the chat here real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, our, um, somebody whose name won't be mentioned, but is our SI, <laughs> remarks that you guys are lucky. You, somebody, uh, somebody in this classroom also did her, did her uh, histograms by hand. So. Uh, it's cool that we can use some technology, and if you have some problems with the technology, please get a hold of us, and we'll help you out with that.